In this video, I want to discuss the physiology of the neuromuscular junction. Uh, neuromuscular junction is a particular kind of synapse, and remember, the synapse is when two cells come together for communication. There are three kinds of synapses we discuss in this course, one of them being a neuromuscular junction. The second one we will discuss is a neuron-to-neuron -neuron synapse. And the last one is a neuroglandular junction between a neuron and a gland. So that means muscle cells, neurons, and glands all can be thought of as excitable cells, meaning that we can change the transmembrane potential of these cells, causing them to do something interesting. So as we do this, we'll look at various aspects of a, of a synapse. And in the middle, you have this area known as the synaptic cleft. This is the space between two cells of a synapse. You have a presynaptic cell and a postsynaptic cell. Presynaptic cells will typically be neurons. In this case, the postsynaptic cell is a muscle. It could be another neuron or a gland, but in the neuromuscular junction, postsynaptic cell is always a muscle. Now, in this case, uh, we will often talk about on the neuron, on the presynaptic cells, on the terminal end of the neuron. There we will have what we often call just the presynaptic membrane. Now, on a postsynaptic cell, we have postsynaptic membranes found here, but on the muscle cell, we call this a motor end plate. So the motor end plate, we will see, gets pretty complicated. And there's a lot of things there. So if I look at the next slide, you guys can see I have three particular kinds of proteins. We have on uh, the postsynaptic cell, we have nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. We have sodium gates, potassium gates, and sodium potassium ATPase pumps. Now, muscle cells and neurons all possess sodium potassium ATPase pumps. Not all cells do. The presynaptic cell on the terminal end possesses vesicles full of neurotransmitters called acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is the chemical messenger of this cell. Now, if we look at the postsynaptic cell, the muscle, right now I've depicted this cell in a polarized resting state. Polarized meaning that it's negative on the inside, positive on the outside. It is negative on the inside in comparison to the outside. We may say slightly negative in comparison to. This is a relative term. Now, as we look at this guy, if you think about the presynaptic cells, the boss, and the postsynaptic cells, the employee, we want to make sure we note that a employee should only, a good employee should only work when the boss says so and do what it tells him to do. So this is how a muscle cell works. It's a perfect employee when normally working. It should only work when a neuron tells it to. So this neuron uh, will be sitting here, hanging out, getting ready, prepared to do what it needs to do. The postsynaptic cell during resting state will kick on a protein called sodium potassium ATPase pump. Now if we look at its name, it is quite a uh, daunting name to try to remember for a little protein. We call it the sodium potassium because of what it pumps. ATPase because it requires ATP pump because it is an active transporter. Ergo, it is a what we call a metabolic pump. And it metabolically, using ATP, will bring in two potassium cations and bring out three sodium cations, setting the transmembrane potential to that of resting. Extremely important. If so if we think about it, inside of this cell of the muscle cell, the postsynaptic cell in the muscle, there is a high concentration of potassium, but a low concentration of sodium. Outside the muscle cell, in the extracellular fluid, ECF, there is a high concentration of sodium, but a low concentration of potassium. This is incredibly important. The entire physiology of the cell is dependent upon the sodium-potassium ATPase pump working properly. And this is what it does. So this is an incredibly important, incredibly important concept that you need to understand why it is important. Because it sets the transmembrane potential so the entire vein can work, and it will do so passively in the next processes. But this is the active part of it. Now, when we go, that I mentioned that the presynaptic cell, the neuron, is the boss. It only works when there's an action potential in that neuron. Action potential shown here is yellow lightning bolts. 
sweep down. Now, when the action potential in the presynaptic cell of the neuron, when it comes down, it will open voltage-gated calcium channels, resulting in calcium-2 cations coming into the cell via diffusion from the extracellular fluid. When that happens, things get really interesting. Excess atosis of acetylcholine result because calcium diffuses into the cell. When the acetylcholine is released, it passes across the synaptic cleft and binds the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Now, I mentioned we call these, we talk about acetylcholine receptors. You need these guys, they're very important. We call them nicotinic because nicotine also binds here, hence why it will be a stimulant, as you will see in, in, in the future. But when these are bound to, you will see that sodium gates open. Now, I have removed everything from the presynaptic cell just to keep this clear, but sodium gates open and sodium starts flooding into the cell. And it does not take long for the sodium to flood into the cell and start getting very positive. And as it begins to get positive, what happens is we, this cell gets excited. And an action potential will happen. The action potential forms on the motor end plate that will come down into the T tubules of the triad, shown as the olive green lines. Uh, the T tubules lead down towards the terminal cisternae of the triad. Remember, a triad is one T tubule, two terminal cisternae. You already know that terminal cisternae stores calcium. Remember, when calcium is inside the terminal cisternae, when calcium is in a high concentration of the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the muscle cells relax. But when it is in low concentration, or to say outside of the terminal cisternae, the muscle is now excited, contracting. So this results in the, excit uh, the excitation, contraction, coupling that we discussed in class. And this is all because sodium rushes into the cell, making it highly positive, formation of an action potential, calcium release, and this is the most critical aspect of what goes on. Remember that calcium will then go into the myofibrils, changing the conformation of the troponin tropomyosin complexes, allowing myosin heads to bind G-actin, and the power strokes will begin there, causing the Z-lines to approach each other, as the zone of overlap to get smaller, uh, causing, the, uh, causing the sarcomere contraction that results in whole muscle contraction all throughout muscle cells. So most important aspect here, very important. Now, after we're done and we move this muscle, well, we use an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase, shown as a little moon-shaped enzyme, and it clears off all the sodium, uh, all the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Now, here's the thing for us to remember. If we want to think of it this way, for simplicity's sake, I have drawn the receptors and the gates separately. But the sodium gates actually possess the acetylcholine receptor sites. So when the acetylcholine is bound to acetylcholine receptors, to nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, sodium gates are open. When I clean it off, sodium gates are closed. Now, in this case, we go back, now that we're still positive because we haven't changed anything. This positivity also results in sodium gates uh, are closed, potassium gates open, potassium rushes out. Remember, there's a high concentration of potassium inside the cell, a low concentration of potassium outside the cell, high to low diffusion. Same thing for sodium. Sodium come in because there was a high concentration of sodium outside in a low end. Also because the cell here is slightly, uh, the, the slight charge differential sometimes will attract, especially inside the cell, is why sodium rushes in. Potassium goes out, the cell starts getting more negative. Now, the sodium potassium ATPase pump kicks back in, resets the transmitting brain potential, and as we really think about it, this resets, everything is reset back as we've seen it before at the very beginning, and you are ready for another cycle. Both cells prepare to do it all again, and then this will continue going through the process of all those things going on. So uh, some of the things we wanted to mention, you guys, I did mention that nicotine can bind to these receptor sites, and if it does bind here, it actually will open these and stimulate cells. 
Now, uh, many neuro, uh, neuroactive chemicals, neurotoxins, will bind to these. It actually causes these to stay closed, they become competitive inhibitors, causing you not being able to excite the muscle cells, causing paralysis, that you can't breathe. And in some cases, we will see that's how many, uh, many medicines work, so very important for pharmacology. Also, if you have a very low sodium level or very low potassium level, potassium to go out of the cell is needed to relax the cell to get the calcium to dump back into the terminal cisternae. So if you can't do that, that is why you have muscle cramps when your potassium levels are low. And if you have very low sodium or potassium, you cannot bind to the, you cannot make this guy work. You have to have sodium and potassium all bound to, to the sodium potassium pumps to cause it to work. So this sets up a lot of interesting pharmacology that if you guys often possess uh, muscle cramping, muscle soreness due to imbalances of these ions. But calcium is also very important. I want to mention also that calcium is a highly sequestered ion, and that is why it's kept in the T-tubule or the uh, terminal cisternae, so that because it can have drastic effects on cells. So we keep it a highly sequestered. We keep it locked up and put up somewhere very important. When you only need it to work, keep it up elsewhere. But this cell is ready to go for another round, and that concludes the basic physiology that happens at neuromuscular junctions. If you have any questions, please consult your textbook, ask your instructors, uh, anything that may help you guys in understanding this very complex physiology. I hope you go back and draw every one of these as you go through, and I hope you find this video helpful. And this concludes my video on the neuromuscular junction.